Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Lecture 3. So we've talked about uh, some physical concepts in Lectures 1 and 2. We've done a little bit of mathematics. Time to get back to MOSFETs. So we're going to apply the concepts that we've been talking about scattering and transmission to the MOSFET and see how we describe MOSFETs when there is some scattering. Okay, We're going to be using our Landauer approach again, um, which expresses the current in terms of transmission, number of channels and differences in Fermi levels, and which can be simplified under low drain bias in this way. Okay, So just to refresh your memory from week three, we derive expressions for the low drain bias current and the high drain bias current using this Landauer formalism under the assumption that the transmission was one. Okay, that's the assumption that we want to relax now. But we came up with very simple expressions which look quite different, especially in the linear regime from the traditional expressions, but we saw that they were really the traditional expressions in disguise. We could make them look like the traditional expressions, we just had to reinterpret some of the parameters. We also had a full range uh, description that described the IV characteristic all the way from small to large drain biases. Okay, So now what we have to do is to put the transmission into this approach and see what happens. So, you know, this, our physical picture for transmission is that we have some slab or channel. Electrons are injected from one side, maybe the source. They propagate across. They undergo some backscattering. Some of them come out and return to the source, but some of them transmit across. And we've de derived an expression for the transmission. You know, it was done with a relatively simple model, but one that actually works remarkably well in practice and gives us a simple description of the transmission, a number between 0 and 1, in terms of the mean free path for backscattering. Okay. So, and we've talked in the last lecture in some detail about, the last two lectures, about the physics that determines that mean free path for backscattering. So now the question is, you know, maybe this is easy. We just take our ballistic expressions and we multiply by T. So let's look at that in a little more detail. Turns out that's all there is to it under low drain bias. So I'm going to assume that the mean free path is independent of the energy that the electrons come in at. Makes the mathematics simpler. If that's not the case, then we should think of this mean free path as some sort of average mean free path. So the lambda naught just means that it's a constant independent of energy. Okay. Well, we can simply take our ballistic expression that we derived in week three, and we'll multiply it by this transmission, and we should have an expression for the linear regime current in the presence of scattering. Okay. So let's see, that's our expression. And uh, it was easy, almost trivial to do the low drain bias regime. Let's look at the high drain bias regime. That's not quite as simple. First thing we would think about doing is simply multiplying our ballistic result by the transmission. Okay. Turns out it's, there's a little more to it than that. So let's look at that a little more carefully. So here's our physical picture. Electrons are injected from the source. This positive flux propagates across and some fraction T comes out. That's our drain current. But in the presence of scattering, some of those injected electrons backscatter and return to the source. What that means is that at the top of the barrier, I have not only positive velocity electrons, I also have negative velocity electrons. In the ballistic case, I only had positive velocity electrons that were injected from the source under high drain biases because nothing can be injected from the drain. In that case, if I want the charge at the top of the barrier, which I get separately from MOS electrostatics, it's just minus to get, because these are negatively charged electrons. The ballistic flux that was injected, I plus ballistic, divided by width of the MOSFET and thermal velocity for unidirectional thermal velocity if I assume Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. Okay, that's my inversion layer charge. In the presence of scattering, I have to add a term. 
there is a positive flux that gives me positive velocity electrons, but now there's a backscattered negative flux that gives me negative velocity electrons. The sum of the positive velocity and negative velocity electrons makes up the total charge. Okay. But the important point to note is that whether I'm under ballistic conditions or whether scattering is occurring, that total charge is determined by MOS electrostatics, not by transport. So these two expressions for charge have to be the same. And what that does is it relates the positive flux to the flux that would have been there under ballistic conditions. I simply equate these two expressions and solve for I plus, and I'll get I plus ballistic divided by two minus the transmission. So you can see that the transmission is between zero and one. So I plus is going to be smaller than I plus ballistic. The reason it can be smaller is that I have not only positive velocities, I have negative velocities. And the two add up to give me the same total inversion layer density. Okay. My on current is just transmission times the positive flux. So it's transmission times this. So it's T over two minus T times the ballistic flux. So I have to be a little bit careful about this bookkeeping, and that means that under high drain bias, I don't simply multiply my ballistic expression by T, I multiply it by T divided by two minus T. That's a consequence of, of the self-consistent MOS electrostatics that maintains the constancy of that inversion layer density at the top of the barrier, whether or not there is scattering. Okay, so now we've got both regimes. We've got the low bias regime and we've got the high bias regime. If we did a little bit more work, we could actually look at the entire IV characteristic from small drain bias to high drain bias and we'd get an expression that looks like that. The important point to note is that it isn't simply T times a ballistic result. It is for low drain bias, but it's not in general when the drain bias is higher. Now. As a preview of things that are going to happen, this isn't quite right. In fact, we will see that the transmission itself is different under low bias and high bias. And that's something that we're going to have to talk about. It's a very interesting and, and actually quite important effect. Okay. Now, if we recall, let's just get calibrated. If, if we look at this extremely thin SOI MOSFET that we were looking at in week three, we looked at these numerical simulations and we saw that the on current was about 60% of the ballistic on current. And if we look down in this linear regime, which is a little harder to do because we have to subtract out parasitic resistances, it turned out that the linear current was about 20% of the ballistic current. So we concluded that MOSFETs deliver a little over half of the ballistic limit for under on current conditions. And the really interesting thing is that the MOSFETs operate closer to the ballistic limit under high drain bias, where the electrons have gained a lot of kinetic energy. They're up in the band structure in the region where there's a lot of density of states. There's a lot of places to scatter to. The main free path should be shorter, but we find that the transmission seems to be higher. So that's very curious and something that we need to understand and we're going to want to talk about. So the key points are that we can look at the ratios of the measured current to the computed ballistic current in small drain bias and large drain bias. We have expressions for the linear current and for the saturated current. And now I've put subscripts to note that the transmission under linear conditions seems to be different than the transmission under saturated or high drain voltage conditions. Well, we can simply take these measured expressions and solve these equations and we can deduce what the linear T is simply from the ratio of the actual current, measured current to the ballistic current, and we can deduce what T sat is from the actual on current to the computed or estimated ballistic on current. So we have a way to go from these measurements to deduce what the transmission is. And the interesting thing is that the transmission is about 20%. So 20% of the electrons that come in from the channel go out the drain contact when the drain bias is low. But when the drain bias is high, 
about 70% of them that come in from the source go out the drain. So that's unexpected. And the question is, you know, why does that occur? Well, let's look a little more carefully. This dotted line here shows me the conduction band profile under low drain bias. So the conduction band in the drain is nearly equal to the conduction band in the source. If I look under high drain bias, then I pull the Fermi level and the drain down, and I have a large potential barrier, and the energy band diagram looks something like this. Now, if I go back to the linear regime, you can see that the transmission just depends on the mean free path and the length of this channel. So T in the linear regime is mean free path over mean free path plus the length of the channel. Under high drain bias, however, I have a low field regime followed by a high field regime. We discussed this in the last lecture and saw that under these conditions, the transmission is controlled by the low field regime. That low field regime is an area that's, that is present and designed and must be there in an electrostatically well-designed MOSFET, one with low S and low Dibble. It has a length script L that's significantly less than the channel length. So I need to replace the actual channel length by this critical low field, the length of that critical low field regime, and I'll get a transmission that's mean free path over mean free path plus the length of the low field region. Now, since the length of the low field region is only a fraction of the channel length, you can see why the transmission can be higher. And that explains qualitatively why the transmission in saturated conditions is higher than the transmission under linear conditions. Okay. Now I want to say just a word about operation near the ballistic limit. Sometimes this is a little confusing because we know that a lot of scattering is going on there. And when we say a device is operating near the ballistic limit, we don't mean that there is no scattering happening in the channel. Now the picture is this. If the electron mean free path is comparable to or larger than the length of this low field regime, this bottleneck regime here at the top of the barrier, then most of the electrons can get across that regime without backscattering. Then even if they do scatter, they're bound to come out the drain. They won't return to the source. So the steady state current won't be affected, even though we may have quite a lot of scattering going on. So that's an interesting point. A device can deliver the steady state near ballistic on current and still have a lot of scattering happening in the channel. The main free path near the drain end where the carriers are highly energetic will be very, very short. But it's the main free path at the top of the barrier that's important. Now another question that people often struggle with is, is mobility relevant to the on current of a nanoscale MOSFET? So mobility is a concept that has a nice, clear, physical meaning under diffusive conditions when the sample is many mean free paths long. It's harder to understand exactly what it is when we think about very short channel devices. Uh, it, this is a very complicated problem in transport physics. Lots of quasi-ballistic transport going on, off equilibrium, non-local, things don't depend on the local electric field. So what does mobility mean? Well, I think about it this way. Mobility is related to the near equilibrium mean free path. So you think about it this way. We saw that there's a direct connection between the diffusion coefficient and the mean free path. The mobility can be determined from the diffusion coefficient by the Einstein relation. So under near equilibrium conditions, the mobility is proportional to the mean free path. Now, in this region near the top of the barrier, the electrons are injected at thermal equilibrium from the source. They're in a low field region, so they're not gaining a lot of kinetic energy and they're not too far out of equilibrium. So the backscattering in the critical region that controls the on current, that backscattering is controlled by the near equilibrium mean free path. Since the near equilibrium mean free path is proportional to the mobility, then measuring the near equilibrium mobility will we will find that it correlates with the measured on current. Okay. Now, but don't forget that the mean free path that we're deducing from the near equilibrium mobility is what we think 
the appropriate mean-free path in this low field regime before the carriers have gained a lot of kinetic energy and can scatter a lot. The mean-free path near the drain end can be very much shorter, but that doesn't control the transmission. Okay. Now, just one more time, let, let's uh, talk briefly here about, you know, where did this T divided by 2 minus T come from? I went through the mathematics, but I just want to point it out here one more time. You know, MOS electrostatics demands that if we've designed the transistor well, we have a fixed inversion layer charge at the top of the barrier. C inversion times VG minus VT. Maybe a little bit of dibble going on. But, the, but this is a, to get the magnitude of the charge there, that's a problem in MOS electrostatics. Under ballistic conditions, we simply inject the positive flux in, and we get a positive half of a Maxwellian or Fermi Dirac distribution, only positive velocities. If we add up all of those positive velocity electrons, that's the inversion charge that MOS electrostatics has demanded. All right, that's what happens when we inject a ballistic flux. Okay. But in the presence of backscattering, we're going to inject a smaller flux because some of them backscatter, and now we add to that Heme Maxwellian a negative part. Won't be as big if there isn't a lot of backscattering, but there will be some there. And what that means is we can inject a smaller positive flux, we can add the backscattered negative flux. The sum of the two will give us the total inversion layer density, and the total inversion layer density, whether in the presence of scattering or in the absence of scattering, is controlled by MOS electrostatics. So we just equated those two expressions, and that gave us this factor, T over 2 minus T, that controls the on current. Okay, so just to wrap up, you can see that once we understand the basic concepts of ballistic MOSFETs from week three and scattering from the first two lectures and mean-free paths here, then it's relatively easy to incorporate scattering into our model, our simple model of the MOSFET. And just to wrap up with the key points, it's obvious scattering reduces the current. The interesting thing is that the transmission of the device is actually higher under high drain bias than under low drain bias, just the opposite of what we might have expected. And that occurs because under low drain bias, the transmission is controlled by scattering in the entire channel. But under high drain bias, the transmission is determined only by scattering in the part of the channel where the electric field is small, and that's the part near the top of the barrier. Scattering in the high field region doesn't matter. So that's the essential physical picture. What we need to do now for the rest of uh, week four is to get a little more comfortable with this physical picture, to relate it again to the traditional view, and to look a little more detail into measurements and see how we can apply this to actual devices and how all this all plays out in, uh, in, in real devices. So we'll continue the discussion and do that in the next two lectures. Thank you for listening.